All right, everyone, what's going on? This is episode two of the podcast, and today we're gonna to get into two more forms, and this time around, I'm gonna be going a little bit more in depth on those forms, breaking down some practice strategies, and going, to, like I said, a little bit more in depth on how to do them and the steps that are being taken. Uh, we're gonna get into some striking drills and talking a little bit about movement in a time where we're really supposed to be isolated and not doing all that much. Um, we're also going to get into the background and the career of a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fighter named Marcelo Garcia. I have some videos that I'm going to be referencing for you guys uh, that you can check out yourself. Um, a match that I thought was really great to study, and uh, there's a video of somebody breaking down Marcelo's game uh, that I thought was really informative and I wanted to share. Uh, in terms of music, we're going to talk about the difference between melody and harmony and how those two things are going to sync up and I'm going to give an example of that today um, and we'll go a little bit more in depth on a few different topics as the podcast goes on today uh, but once again thanks so much for checking it out. Um, one thing I've really reflected on during this time off is the difference between being bored and just not being preoccupied. You know myself like I'm sure for many of you you know most of my days prior to this situation were filled and from sun up to sundown, I was doing something all day long. And while that's not a bad thing, and I certainly miss that, I think this is a real blessing and an opportunity to give our brains a bit of a reset and, um, you know, to not mistake, like I said, being bored for just not being preoccupied. Um, in fact, it's a great way to learn how to manage time without always having something to do. At least that's what I've been trying to work on. Uh, during this little brief period here where we have some time off from what we consider normal. Um, so, you know, with the situation we have, we have to kind of uh, use it to our advantage and, you know, kind of like martial arts, we want to see how we can benefit or learn from every situation, including this one. Uh, so rather than feeling like despair or feeling like, you know, our lives are in total chaos, we want to always like study and we always want to be students of, you know, not just martial arts, but of life and see what we can take from every single day. And so, like I said, that's what I've taken away from this situation. And I really see it actually as a, a blessing and a way to a way to learn uh, during a unique period in time. So thank you again for checking the video out. I really hope you enjoy it. I uh, have a lot of fun making these and Hopefully I will see you guys soon. All right guys, so now we are gonna get into the second form and this is Seki Hyung Ibu. So like I said in the beginning of the video, I'm gonna break it down a little bit more for you guys practicing at home. Um, so we'll start in the Chunbi or the ready stance, okay? So in this instance, no matter which way you're facing, you're always gonna cross your left arm down and you're gonna be pulling your left foot in. Okay, and a good practice tip for doing this without having to memorize it too much is you get a little muscle memory. And so you break it down in parts. You just first start practicing crossing and then you'll add steps to it, like pulling your foot in. And then you'll continue that pattern to go through the form. So I brought that arm down, brought the leg in and I'm gonna to turn towards a high block. Okay, I'm just gonna keep that front knee bent and pull my back leg in, keeping that bend as I then step forward and punch up. From there, I'm gonna be bringing that punching arm down as I look over the shoulder, keeping the knee bent until I'm ready to pull it in. From here, I'm gonna keep those knees bent until I fully turn and block up. I then, again, re-chamber and punch forward into the eye. I then look to the middle and get into a traditional fighting stance. So for this, you wanna take your time. Uh, today, I'm gonna be doing it a little bit quicker, uh, but when you're throwing these side kicks, you want to work on getting the balance first and then the recoil and then landing in the stance. The wrong way to do it in my opinion is when you kick, you don't want to fall forward. So it's like after I kick, I just fall forward. Uh, it doesn't show a lot of control and ultimately you don't have a consistent stance. So what I'm going to try and do is after I kick, recoil it and rather than falling forward, I'm just going to be bringing my foot straight down. So I bring it around the kick and then I drop it down. Okay, and I repeat that a couple times. Third one. Okay, and so if you could come around here. Now what I'm gonna be doing is bringing this backhand down, okay? 
So with all forms, more or less, my leg that I'm moving is gonna be corresponding with the arm that's crossing. From here, I cross down, I look and pull in, and that same foot that just pulled in is gonna be going out for high block, okay? So what I just did in a really simple way is I just made a straight line with my foot, okay? Losing a one straight line. Bringing the foot in makes that a little bit more powerful because I'm bringing my hips rather just than around. I'm also bringing them forward for the block. And then I slide up, punch. Gonna then bring it down, look, that knee that, that stays chambered, and I go forward and strike up, punch. And then same thing, I look and bend, and don't fall forward. Keep the posture. And here, I'm gonna be bringing this hand down, looking over that shoulder, bring it up from here a little bit, pull the foot in, and keep that chamber, and I explode forward, block and step a punch the punching hand goes down i look over the shoulder the knee that's bent pulls in keep the chamber and then block up punch and that's the end of the thing all right guys so today we are also going to be getting into the fourth form uh called pidan chodan and uh again we're going to break it down a little bit more than we typically do so here we go we start in our chumbi position, and the first three parts of this form are the exact same as Siki Hyung Yobu, which is the first form. So I'm gonna be bringing my hand up, and the same side leg is gonna pull in, and I'm keeping those knees bent for a low block. I then slide up, keeping the chamber, and punch to the middle of my chest, okay? Then I bring that punching hand up, and that knee that's bent is going to pull in, as I step all the way around for a low block. So if you could come over here. So once we're here, we get to this low block, we're gonna do what's called the four count, okay? The four count is when I pull my hand in, I then pull my foot in and make the letter L with my feet. And I bring that hand that was down up, the other one on the inside. Okay, so I'm chambered here. I then will extend my arm and my leg and then lean forward until I land into the punch. Okay, so again, that goes like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, so if you can come back to the middle, please. So now that I'm here, my punching arm is gonna come up. I'm pulling my front leg in all the way and turning into a low block. From here, I'm gonna be turning both toes to the side my hips and my shoulders while keeping an arch in my back. The hand that's down is gonna come underneath. The hand by my side is coming on top. So I'm going from a low block, chambering, again, going all the way to a different stance, arching my back, and then shifting again forward to a pseudo. My fingers are together, my thumb is tucked, and my hand is by my side. Now, in the same way we, we do three kicks towards the middle, we're now gonna do three high blocks. So I always cross down, pull in and block up. I do that again. And one more time. From here, the hand by my side is gonna come up. The hand that was up is gonna come down. And my back leg is essentially gonna be making a straight line all the way around. But again, I bring that back foot in to make my body compact and then go for a low block. And then I slide up punch that punching hand comes up i look and spin all the way around low block and step up and punch so then you can bring the camera over here please so with all the forms uh you want to not bite off more than you can chew so in order to do them well you have to rely less on your mental memory and more on muscle memory so for instance, with this form, maybe you'll just take the first three steps and you'll get really good at them and be able to do them with some strength. So if you're always trying to rely on your memory, uh, it's gonna be too much on your brain and you'll end up making mistakes. Uh, so for instance, 
with this next part where I cross up, I pull the front foot in and do a low block. Maybe I'll just do that, uh, you know, for a week straight. We have plenty of time. And in doing so, I have to remember it less and I can just do it with a lot more ease. Okay, so from here, I'm gonna be stepping up with a punch and then consecutively doing two more. After I get to this punch here, we're gonna be doing what's called a Haran Surumaki. Um, in this instance, I'm bringing the punching hand behind me. I'm looking over my back shoulder and pulling my back foot in, going toes first and blocking, okay? From here, the hand that's by the knee is going to reach behind, the other one comes up, I'm going toes first and blocking. I then bring in, so the hand that was down by the knee is gonna come up, the other one's gonna come behind. I pull that front leg in, going to block. I then bring that hand by the knee behind, and the other one to the corner, and block. And that's how you end Pidan Chota. All right guys, so now we're gonna get into the striking drill. It's pretty basic this week, and um, we're just gonna start in our kickboxing stand. So if you have younger students at home, quite simply, this is all they need to work on, is just keeping in this, what we would call the uh, shark cage or in a fort. My elbows are just about at shoulder height, my chin's down, both my knees are bent, I'm up on the ball of the foot on my back heel, and I'm keeping, like, like I said, my chin tucked. So in this instance, we're just gonna work on angling with our jab, okay? So we're gonna start off by just throwing one. I'm stepping my front foot a little bit, tucking my chin and keeping that elbow in tight. So just step and bring it back, okay? When I recoil it, I don't want my hand to drop, okay? We wanna just go in one straight line, forward and back, okay? So now when we angle, I'm gonna use my front foot first and step, not a lot. Uh, the fist is pretty small, so you don't need to make gigantic movements. Um, so I'm just going to step to the side a little bit and pivot my back foot and then throw another. Okay, so coming in, one, step the front foot, pivot the back foot, and throw two. One, two. Keeping in that stance. One, two. Okay, so that's the uh, striking drill of the week. And as I talked about, you know, when it comes to movement in a time like this, um, this is really an excellent drill to do. Um, all these forms, everything that we do in these videos, even if you're not a, you know, karate student, if you're a parent or a sibling, simple movements like this, uh, they don't require a partner. It doesn't require a lot of energy or even a high level of knowledge or skill. Um, and it's a great way to stretch, move your body in a time where, you know, we're probably a little bit more still than we usually are. And while that's not a bad thing per se, uh, we also want to make sure that we're staying active and doing what we can with what we have. All right guys, so now we are gonna be talking about Marcelo Garcia. He is a fourth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and has won over, uh, I think 80 fights, like 86 fights or something like that. Um, a little backstory on him, he was born in a small town in Brazil and like many martial artists, you know, would see karate TV shows and movies and that spiked his interest in martial arts. And so from there he picked up karate and trained under that for a number of years. Uh, he eventually fell out of karate, and after a year off of training, um, he was introduced to judo by a friend, and he fell in love with it. Um, and you can see that influence all throughout his uh, martial art career, basically. Um, but his judo instructor at the time was taking some Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes, and being from a small town, there just wasn't Brazilian jiu-jitsu where he was. That was mainly in the larger cities. And so he took the opportunity to begin training, and that's kind of where his career began. And, you know, he would compete at some small tournaments, uh, but eventually was offered free training and a place to live at a gym. Uh, in return, he would clean the mats and run errands and kind of tend to the school, but he literally lived at uh, this gym. 
and would train, I think, you know, four times a day or something like that. Uh, and in my research here, it says he would begin training at 6 a.m., then again would train at 8 a.m., then at 3 p.m., and then at 7 p.m. So he was extremely dedicated to learning. And it says here that this is basically where his jujitsu game began to become very strong. Um, and as time went on and he became better, he won world championships and earned his black belt under Fabio Gagel and was the eighth black belt under Fabio um, from Alliance Jiu-Jitsu. So really cool lineage. And um, I believe now his school is in, it's here, yeah, it says it's in Manhattan, New York. Um, it's a world-renowned gym. People from all over the world have gone to train there. And, um, you know, he has really proven uh, that he's probably one of the greatest of all time in jiu-jitsu. So to learn from him or go to his school is a really unique opportunity. Um, some of the things that we think are, you know, staples in modern-day jiu-jitsu, particularly in no-gi jiu-jitsu, he kind of developed part of that game, uh, you know, earlier on in his career, um, used a lot of arm drags and whatnot. And um, he's been extremely innovative in the world of jujitsu. Um, he's gone against opponents that are much stronger or much bigger than him and has actually been successful and won. Um, and, you know, there's plenty of highlights on YouTube and online where you can see throughout his career, he just was like fearless and would go against people that were, you know, equally skilled as him, or like I said, bigger, and would still compete, not always win, but often would. And it's a huge testament to jujitsu, to his character, and to, you know, what can happen if you really dedicate yourself to learning. So I'm going to be linking two videos. The first is a match that I felt was really unique to study. And the second is under um, a YouTuber named Jack Slack. But basically, in his video, he broke down Marcelo's game, kind of went over more minute details of why he does what he does and why it's successful. And so I wanted to share that video as I found it to be very informative, um, really good highlights in that video as well. And it's you know age appropriate. So if you have a young one at home wanting to see some really good martial arts, or if you're an adult and you've never even heard of who this is, uh, this is an excellent video to, to study. So again, um, that's Marcelo Garcia. Again, one of the greatest martial artists in jiu-jitsu, probably of all time. And uh, I really look forward to you guys getting to study uh, how he competes and trains. And so now we are going to get on to the music portion of this episode. Thanks. All right, guys, we are now on to the music part of the podcast. And again, today we're talking about the difference between melody and harmony. At least on guitar, the way I teach it is, Melody is just a sequence of individual notes that are played separately, whereas harmony is when you have a sequence of notes that are played at the same time over top of one another. So an example of melody is this. harmony would be say like a chord where I have again a bunch of individual notes but they're played together and they typically complement each other. So they're not all the same but uh, they're played and set up in such a way where again tone wise they match. So now I'm going to give an example using a loop pedal that I have in my electric guitar of how melody and harmony will intersect. Thank you. 
right, guys, so that wraps up episode two. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun making it. Uh, just to finish everything off, I have two books I'm going to be recommending. One for the kids is called Courage by Bernard Weber. Uh, it's a really short story. You, uh, you can find it on YouTube for free. Um, it was given to me uh, a little while back, uh, and I really think it's a great, simple read, a uh, good message. And a book I'm currently getting into now is The Count of Monte Cristo, and um, it's an awesome, awesome book so far. Uh, again, I, I have found it on YouTube totally for free, audiobook, uh, but so far uh, it's a really interesting read and uh, a good story. So again, thank you so much for checking it out. Uh, at the end of the video, I'm going to be posting uh, Gabby's recipe of the week. And again, thanks so much. I will see you guys soon.